Hi, this is Robert O'Reilly. My name is Gowron. Honor to you and your house. You're listening to Trek FM. Theo Grey Hot. Welcome to another episode of Earl Grey. I'm your host, Amy Nelson, and joined with me today are Richard and Lee. Richard, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Happy Easter over there, Amy. Well, it is. We are recording on Easter. This will drop a few days later, but happy Easter, everyone. And Lee, how are you over there? Well, you could say I have also returned. Um, yes, it's a, <laughs> in the it's Easter tradition. Yeah, I was obviously off last week. Um, the recording day switched. So sadly, I had to uh, sleep while you guys recorded. So uh, I'm back and then I'm away next weekend off on a exotic trip up the coast. So um, yes, uh, I'm back and then I'm going to go back north, I suppose. <laughs> Yes, Lee is the one who has a life out of all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we are excited. Um, we are going to talk about our unsung episode, season three. Now, uh, we are doing this uh, in to commemorate Next Generation's 30th anniversary this year. And so we are going through each of the seasons and picking episodes that don't get a lot of love and that we feel uh, you might consider to rewatch uh, with a new light and new perspective. So we have come up with each of us a list of three episodes, which has been very difficult to choose from. I mean, season one and season two was difficult, but even more so, I feel, for this season what do you guys think yeah i mean you you've you've sent us our homework we're not allowed to pick certain episodes which always makes it all the more harder so yeah we've certainly had to to think deep and hard about those unsung episodes when the season is is so full of amazing big big episodes yesterday's enterprise best of both worlds it really kind of you know made the next generation the show that kind of everyone started to fall in love with at that part so yeah i've certainly had to had to think sat on the toilet just going through the list of season three episodes kind of scrolling them off which ones are the most important and i, I think i'm happy with my list oh good yeah so we are not choosing who watches the watchers we're not choosing yesterday's enterprise and we're not choosing best of both worlds i think everyone can agree that those are fan favorites um so richard how was it uh, for you choosing your uh three episodes <laughs> Well, you know, my favorite episode in the whole entire world is on this one. So, of course, I got to choose that one. <laughs> but, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it was very difficult. There are some really good episodes that I really like a lot. And I'm sure a lot of people like them as well. And I would hope I, w- I would at least I hope so. Um, but, yeah, it's it definitely was hard. I wasn't sitting on the pot, but I was. um Definitely uh, going through the list in bed last night. So. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was thinking, I was like, okay, so which ones do fans not like? And I, of course, do like. So that's sort of the twist that I went with. So let's get right to it. Um, Lee, give us an episode and uh, your thoughts on it. Yeah, I've gone for, I suppose, an episode some people think is absolutely atrocious. Um, It's Captain's Holiday, which I'm a big fan of. Um, I think it's important for a couple different reasons. I always try and pick something like a little obtuse about an episode or something a little different that's maybe been overlooked and I think I would think back to our nemesis chat where we talked about like movie Picard is nothing like TV Picard well he's a bit like Picard and Captain's Holiday and um, I think it was Iris Stephen Bear um, Patrick Stewart went up to and he went 
I just want Captain Picard to shoot a gun and get laid. I think he must have probably been watching James Bond or something the night before. So Captain's Holiday was going to be a bit of a kind of run-of-the-mill episode. And then it's now we've got this Captain where he's a bit of a swashbuckler. You know, he's getting in there with the ladies. He's firing some guns. He's kind of an archaeologist. He's channeling his own Indiana Jones, a little bit of James Bond. And I think it's an interesting episode that first stripped to rise as well, um, which always seemed to kind of get associated with some pretty poor episodes so this I think this is probably the best Rise episode and yeah I think it's a, a good precursor to the action Picard we're going to get in like five years time in some of the Star Trek movies and I think it's an interesting step in seeing our our kind of peaceful Shakespeare quoting captain become a bit more kind of a bit more worldly in a way yeah, I love the introduction of Vosh. She makes the show. She's excellent. Uh, she just mixes so well with Picard. It's it's really fun to, to see. And, of course, all the teasing for the Horgon, and he just wants to read his book. That, that was perfect setup by Riker. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's typical Riker as well, you could say. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, what did you think of Captain's Holiday? I I love uh, Captain's Holiday. I wanted to choose that one, but I, I figured one of you two would have done that. But uh, yeah, it's definitely one of those. Uh, definitely a fun episode. Uh, I, yeah, it was uh, it was a it was a lot of fun. I, I absolutely love that episode. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> excellent. All right, Richard, give us one from your list. All right. So besides Tin Man, we're not going to discuss that one. Well, um, we already did. But we already did. <laughs> you can find us drone on endlessly about Tin Man on a previous episode. So yeah, check it out. Yeah, you're going to have to find it somewhere. <laughs> you can put like an extended edition of this out where it's kind of like the Lord of the Rings. Just like insert a previous <laughs> podcast episode into this. Like I'm going to talk about Tin Man insert extended cut, cut shot here cut to like 50 minutes later so amy what's your first choice <laughs> nice <laughs> um i actually chose as my first one as the ensigns of command um one of my favorite episodes uh, i mean granted it's a data story uh, i'm not entirely too fond of uh, data stories all the time but this one is w- by far one of my favorite ones and it's mostly because you know it's basically like first contact but not you know he's they're relocating another planet uh, they're relocating the entire colony to another planet and it's just it's i guess if you're lost and um, you've been um, you've been forgotten for a long time that your civilization is um or that civilization your colony um you know you've built so much on this colony and you don't want to leave and yet you know they don't understand the the magnitude of their of their problem and i love that how data actually explains um you know this is this is what could happen and you're you really want to go up against them <laughs> sort of thing so it's like yeah it, it's one of those good episodes that i like about uh you know it's awful, obviously um I guess kind of prime directive, but not really, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the one with the Shelly act, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. So whenever I think of that episode, I'm always, the Shelly act is what comes to mind. And this is where Picard is at his best being the diplomat, being the one that goes to the rules and regulations to talk his way out of it and comes up with this brilliant idea of, well, we need a mediator and this mediator happens to be, you know, in hibernation and can't get here. And so that's the way you want to play. We're going to play by the rules and this is the rule that we want. And so it's just perfect. I love uh, the outcome of that. Just really highlights Picard's strength in diplomacy. I always think of it for Picard acknowledging that dust exists on a starship that when he goes over to the plaque and he just gives it a wee little check to see if there's any dust. So yeah, that even in all these centuries from now, there's still going to be the problem of dust to be dealt with in space. Housekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 don't, 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 don't give the idea that we're on a starship, a uh, hotel starship here. <laughs> yes, Hilton and the stars. <laughs> That's for Zach and Ken. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Amy? What's your first pick? Okay, so one that I know uh, a lot of people 
generally don't like, and I know that the writers themselves um, didn't really care for it, but I love it. It's the high ground. And this is otherwise known as the terrorism episode. And so they're in... uh, Beverly gets taken by one of the terrorists, Finn, and they have to resolve the situation. And and so what... Why do I like this? I Well, first of all, I really like his drawing of Beverly Crusher, and that just really sticks in my memory. I mean, the, the drawing, the chalk drawing that he does of her, and, you know, you can see that he has a heart. And so we get this play on, well, ooh, the bad terrorists and that usually society has. But well, we it's flipped, and we get to see his side of the story. And there are a lot of fabulous, fabulous quotes um, with Finn and Crusher and Picard and Data where they're talking about terrorism and is it effective? Is it worth doing? I mean, everyone war is a battle and you're going to have loss on all sides. And so I like um, to see that the flip side of it, you know, with, with Finn and his purpose. Do you think that this was uh, one of those scripts that they were testing out for like Deep Space Nine for like the, the Maquis and everything? Mm, I think it's probably a bit too early at that stage. Like, yeah, the Maquis really didn't come around till kind of about, you know, four more years really in Star Trek. And I think definitely I think it was more of a sign of the... <laughs> maybe straying away from the Star Trek vision just a little bit with Gene Roddenberry's ill health really at the time and kind of this new blood of writer coming in, you know, the Michael Pillars, the the Rick, the Brandon Braggas, etc. Um, being able to kind of make the show just a little bit darker and I think it's a precursor to what these writers could do on Deep Space Nine, I think. Yeah, it does definitely get that darker twist and yeah. I mean, because like it was 1990 and really terrorism didn't really hit its stride until what I think it was like probably late uh, two or three more years later. Um, but like, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, this was actually my second pick. <laughs> oh. So thanks. Amy. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> but, well, they yeah. did have mention of the, uh, Ireland. Yes. Uh, well, yes, yeah. this is where, yes. this is where I'm going to come in. So, uh, thank you. I'm, I, I'm not going to change. I know something when we have a clash, we go for to an honorable mention, but I'm going to stick my, my fork in this. This is my second choice and I'm going to stick with it because it kind of ties into that that um, this episode in the UK was, it was banned in Ireland and it was censored here in the UK. And the reason for that was that they talked about a united Ireland. Um, You know, kind of during the 90s, you know, you really are at the tail end of the IRA. um, The the troubles were kind of essentially over really at that point. And it was all about the kind of uh, the peacekeeping process. And the idea of a united Ireland was a very, very controversial remark. So it wasn't shown in Ireland. Uh, when it was shown on the BBC, that remark was not there. Um, and it took until, yeah, 2006. So about 11 years ago was the first time you could watch this episode unedited in the UK. And that's kind of mind blowing. You think of all the things in Star Trek history, all these different pieces. Um, and this was the thing that kind of went through the sense. I mean, it was released on video without any issues, but it was, uh, yeah, you couldn't watch this episode. So someday someone that was just sitting watching it on their TV box in 2006 went, wait, I don't remember that line. So yeah, I mean, with the way things are going in the UK just now, there is a bit more talk of potentially United Ireland um, as a consequence of Brexit and borders and such like. So it is potential that by 2024, there might be a United Ireland. So Star Trek, you know, could could be potentially close to on the ball for that one. So uh, maybe uh, Michael Pillars put a few, a few well, well, rest in peace. Well, perhaps he put a few quid on that kind of coming true. So uh, yeah, um, pretty interesting, really. So yeah, like I, I know we've uh, both got it as our, our choice there, but I'm going to, I'm going to stick with it. I think for, for that different reason, it's a historical one for censor- censorship and Star Trek. Yeah, I was going to mention that as well, but you did a fabulous job. And it reminds me uh, on Standard Orbit, Ken and Zach did an episode of uh, episodes that were banned in the UK. Mm -hmm. So this as one more to the list. 
Um, so yeah. And I like also that it's a, a crusher heavy episode cause we don't get to see too much of her as well. Richard, why did you have this as your number two? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I I liked it for I, I liked it for mainly because it was yes like you, like you were saying it's a crusher episode we don't see very many of them um, it's by far one of the better ones or at least I thought so I didn't think it was terribly written I mean I know I've heard the criticism of it and uh, the reception of the of the actual episode those who actually could have could watch it i mean i thought it was actually pretty good i mean i actually forgot about it because when we were going through these i when i went through the synopsis on some of these episodes like oh my gosh i haven't seen this one in years and um i mean i i could see early 1990s okay let's just say the uh uh the whole um uh, nra or nra's uh is it NRA? No, that's, uh, that's the NASA, NRA right? is a. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, both the IRA and the NRA are fans of guns. Um, yes, they are. <laughs> I, I can't don't believe quite I said think NRA. they've got the same uh, same issues. Uh, no, no, the NRA hasn't gone to civil war yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yet being the key word. Yeah, yeah exactly. IRA. Um, is it a IRA? That's what I meant to say. <laughs> um. So, oh man, I lost my track of thought on that one. Um. <laughs> I can't believe well, I said Well, let me NRA. put in a quote here that I really liked. Finn was uh, talking with Crusher and says, I'm willing to die for my freedom. And in the finest tradition of your own great civilization, I'm willing to kill for it too. Um, I like that, you know, he... Here's this guy on this strange planet, different worlds, yet knowing about our civilization. I found that funny. But, I mean, he makes a, a good point that it's like we, if within our own history, you know, have have experienced this. And he's like, this is a war for independence. And I'm no better or different than your own George Washington. And Crusher says, Washington was a military general, not a terrorist. Ah, uh, The difference between generals and terrorists is only the difference between between winners and losers. If you win, you're called a general. <laughs> One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. I always think of things like um, Living Daylights, the Timothy Dalton, James Bond movie, and I think it was at Rambo 3 or something like that, where they're, they're working together with um, what was essentially Al-Qaeda. And I think it's the end of Rambo. It's like uh, much love to our uh, brother, their Mucha Hajin brothers in the, uh, the Middle East. And it, it just goes to show how quickly these things can, can swing, really. You know, people who are considered allies can become, you know, trouble people that are trouble can become part of the peacekeeping process you know you only have to think of martin mcginnis you know an ira leader who recently died this year uh, this year and you know people from all around the world former presidents prime ministers all came together for his funeral which is hard to think from what was essentially a terrorist uh, only a few decades ago so yeah these things can really spin on a dime history can judge who who is a terrorist and who is a, a freedom fighter a bit more a bit more liberal in a bit more of a, a liberal way these days yeah mm. yeah well what Go i was going to say okay <laughs> cuz you know i could see this this is uh, this would um i could see that this episode uh, would would I, I, it's it's just a good thing that this episode uh, aired in 1990 because if this was done uh, like any any later than that like 01 or even past that this I don't I don't think this uh, episode would have been uh, would have been at all I mean it would have been far more hated than any other episode I guarantee it because I mean it's sort of like I don't want to say I guess it's romanticizing the 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 terrorist side of, I mean, especially with what we're going, what, what, you know, what the United States went through, it's, it's sort of like putting like a personality to terrorism. And I don't know, I, I personally don't like that, well, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, um, I, you know, it, it's the other side. And like you said, you know, it's, it is, it, it's a perfect quote that whoever, whoever wins the war basically, you know, gets to tell the, uh, gets, gets to tell the, um, the, the their the side history. of the story mm-hmm. exactly history written by exactly. the victors as uh, Gary right. once said but I think we, like, exactly. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to disagree with your point there Richard because I think of Deep Space Nine in particular where this episode kind of yeah it dips its toes into terrorism and Trek and then um, 
Deep Space Nine, for example, just goes all in. You know, our, our second in command is a former terrorist slash freedom fighter, depending on who you ask. Um, and that they never hide from that. And there's so many episodes about dealing with the, you know, that aspect of the terrorists that become political leaders, the terrorists or freedom fighters that can't go on and live in peace in our time in a way. Um, and Deep Space Nine is considered this amazing, incredible show and ahead of its time for its view on terrorism and get very bold for its time and it's, it's very much respected for that so I, I don't know I don't think it would be perhaps hated I think it could be viewed much like Deep Space Nine and considered good TV yeah, I don't know about that. Because, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I like the, uh, the, the Maki uh, uh, story arc, and but, like, yeah, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother yeah. can. <laughs> yeah, I think there's an episode in itself, yeah. you know, there terrorism you and TNG. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. touch yeah. on that, I'm sure, at some point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, we all approve uh, of the high ground. So listeners, let us know what you think of that. All right, so we are on to our second round. Lee, give us another one. Uh, I'm going to have to say my second round choice was uh, obviously uh, higher ground there. Um, I know we're meant oh, to pick that right. thing. Yeah, so yeah. Do, do you have... Okay. All righty, Richard, then that's your second. All right. Yeah, so yeah I was going to say, we might just go to you. <laughs> All right. Woohoo. Well, uh, my second pick then is uh, Allegiance. And this is the one where Picard is abducted into this laboratory and experiments. And uh, and then, but we still have this fake Picard, this uh, doppelganger of Picard still on the ship. And so I really like this. First, why I like this is because it shows Picard's leadership and the aliens are trying to, you know, manipulate different scenarios and try and, you know, uh, control their food and obviously their surroundings. And, uh, so we see Picard just do what he does best. And we know why he's captain is because he is the one, uh, taking control and, and doing good with the other species and understanding, um, all of their context of their, culture. And so I really, I chose it for that because I like seeing his leadership style in that. But we get our fake Picard and he's singing in 10 forward. He's inviting Beverly to his cabin and dancing with her and the kiss. And you're like, oh, it's so wonderful. And so, yeah, I like Allegiance. Uh, What do you think? Ails for everyone. Yeah, it's a it's a cracking episode. Yeah, I think it's it's a somewhat I don't think it, of a, much of a memorable episode, but I just always remember the the ales and the shanties for everyone. Uh, yeah, I am sure. Actually, I think he seems more like a British captain than a French captain uh, <laughs> doing that. That's for sure. Yeah, Richard, did you like Allegiance? I did. Um, it wasn't it wasn't put on my list, but um, it, or at least it didn't rank high enough to be on my list. But yeah, I, I, I like this episode. It was really it was really a, yeah, it was a really good episode. I, I yeah. So um, just to note that uh, Picard, well, his fake Picard uh, drops in when they're playing poker. And this only happens twice with the other time being all good things. So we get to see that. I like that. And um, so, yeah, I just I like seeing Picard because his brain is working nonstop and he's trying to figure out, you know, this whodunit. Where am I? What's going on? Why does this feel like, you know, I'm in this rat race and in this lab and finally figures out that it's Cadet Harrow and and then he refuses to cooperate any further. And then they I just think it's it's fun. It's sort of a whodunit. And we get to see Picard like in Captain's Hollow. Well, even though it's a fake Picard, but, you know, he's blending in and being this other mildly different captain. And I think it it works well. So I chose Allegiance for my second pick. All right. So we are on to our third round picks, Lee. Yeah, I've gone with an episode that I, I think I love and is potentially could be argued maybe one of the best TNG episodes. Um, Sarek. I think it's a fantastically written episode. Um, And the reason I've picked it is not just because it is a brilliantly written, um, powerful episode, but really the kind of... 
if anyone kind of has listened to and watched some of the behind the scenes stuff, um, Sarek is an episode where um, it was a fighting battle that like the the team Ira um, was really keen to like they wanted to mention Spock. Like, just to mention Spock. I mean, it's got Sarah, it's got Spock's dad in it. And, like, Rick Berman's like, no, we can't, we can't, you know, really link it with the original series. It's got to stand on its own. And really up until that point, any crossover was uh, The Naked Now, um, which, for better or worse, is um, an interesting choice. Um, and then we see Admiral uh, McCoy uh, giving the ha- passing the baton in a way. And they fought and they fought and they fought to get Spock mentioned in this episode. And I think the scene and potentially Patrick Stewart's finest moment is Picard when he's channeling all the suppressed Vulcan emotions, rage, feelings, frustrations. And when he calls out Spock's name, it's just an incredible moment. And how hard they had to fight just to get that one word in there. And it really packs a punch. So I think for... You know, you think of shows these days, especially franchises, where they just love crossing over here, there, and everywhere, and plugs, and we'll see more of that in Star Trek in the future. But this one is quite groundbreaking, and it's only a word, and they had to fight so hard for that. And it's such change days. So, yeah, for that reason alone, that's why I'm picking uh, Sarek. I love this episode a lot. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's yeah uh, uh anytime we deal uh deal with a uh, crossover for especially tos i love this I, I i love that it's 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 such a great episode it really is yeah Amy? yeah the drama and the emotion of it all you know because you're supposed to be suppressing the emotions and then bringing in the the ailment the sickness that he has and to deal with this one last uh, mission that Sarah has and it's all so good and you get so much of the Vulcan culture and Sarah's wife oh dear I forget her name anyway she's fabulous and it it is it's a fabulous excellent episode very good Excellent. All right, Richard, give us one from your list. So I wouldn't doubt if there are bets going out right now. So, but I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna say Tin Man, <laughs> but I'm gonna go with Sins of the Father. Oh, okay. Oh, love. <laughs> I love this episode so much because I love Commander Kern. Kern is just one of those guys. I mean, he's hard on everyone except for Worf. It's like. <laughs> you want to talk about getting under someone's skin. He's like, of course, the guy who, who expects the, the most work in the whole entire ship is the one who gets treated nicely. <laughs> it is just, I mean, cause like, um, oh crap. What was that other one with the, with Riker? Um, um, where Riker goes on it's yes. the exchange. Yeah. I can't remember the episode name. Anyway. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm just going to look it up. <laughs> So this was on my honorable mention, and uh, I really like this. We learn, yeah, Worf has a brother, Kern, and we go uh, to, for the first time, the home world, Kronos. 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 Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I like this because, and I was thinking that you would put this on your list, Richard, um, because we really see Worf sacrifice and, you know, it just begs the question, what would you do to save your country, your culture? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I just figured, yep, Richard is going to put this on his list. And I agree. It's a fabulous episode. And I love, it seems that finally this, well, for me, that this Klingon and the Worf story is finally something that's not episodic TV. And we Mm -hmm. know TNG is so much, you know, just an episode here and there. But this arc uh, that we get introduced with Worf story is amazing. And it just continues uh, throughout all the seasons. So that's why I chose it. Yeah, it's it's on my... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, yeah, go it's ahead. on my honorable mentions list. Um, just solely based on it, kicks off Ronald D. Moore's association with being that Klingon guy on Star Trek, and um, yeah, and sins of father that'll follow on into um, 
oh, what's the episode? Reunion and then Redemption, Redemption 2 and Beyond mm-hmm. and Alexander and you know, everything between. I think it's just a, a hell of a run that they go on from here and, you know, picking up from Emissary as well. Um, yeah, I love this episode, yeah. Yeah, and in the, the episode is called A Matter of Honor. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I just had I had to look at that up real quick. But um, there was a post uh, on the Babel Conference, and I don't know if you guys saw it or not, but someone was... I guess talking about how Klingons uh, were overused in TNG and it, from base, based from what I saw it was mostly to do with politics and that's what I love about the Klingons especially in TNG because it it uh, it just you 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 find out so much more about a, uh, or uh, I guess a, a species or country or whatever you want to call it Race um, based or, on their yeah. politics. <laughs> I mean, you you see how they act, see how uh, see what kind of troubles are going on through uh, into the, in the country or kingdom, whatever. Um, in this case, empire. Um, and that's what I lo- and, and you know that's ultimately what I love about uh, is uh, the Klingons is that it, they're they're. The politics are, it's all about honor. It's all about pride and everything. And of course, you know, I'm sure if Worf would have known about <laughs> the, the, the the Empire going to the Civil War, he probably would have plunged it right there. <laughs> and that would have been one heck of a story. But like, yeah, it's it's one of my, it's the start of one of my favorite uh, story arcs, which is predominantly the Klingons, especially in Deep Space Nine. That's also what I love about Deep Space Nine is the Klingon story arc. Yeah, like, yeah oh. I saw. Oh, I saw that on the Babel conference too, and was really surprised. So sorry, listeners, for those that well, don't there, enjoy the Klingon. There was a episodes. lot of people that actually did like the Klingons specifically for the politics, yeah. which I which I thought was uh, which was surprising to me because I actually figured a lot of people would actually hate it for the politics, but I love it so. Based yeah. on the politics of the UK and America at the moment, I, uh, let's just let's tread away from saying that uh, our uh, politics can define a, uh, a nation. Uh, I'm feeling a bit nervous here. Um, no, I, I really like the Klingon politics as well. I find it incredibly fascinating. A lot of the credit goes to Michael Dorn and um, Robert O'Reilly and J.G. Hertzler and uh, Ronald D. Moore for a lot of their contributions. Like, if there was like a Klingon version of like MSNBC or CNN, I'd be watching that stuff like all the time. Like, I can. Yep. Just imagine watching it going like, I wonder who the, the Klingon Anderson Cooper is, where it goes, now we're cutting to the Klingon High Council and like there's the Klingon version of Sean Spicer and, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I would pay good money to see that as like a spin off series, you know. Uh, sign me up. That is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I feel right. Well, I, and I suppose, you know, the, the Romulans, you know, kind of influenced the kind of Klingon elections and, you know, I suppose what's kind of uncanny you know but i wonder what the klingon version of fox news would be like that would be kind of like that would be like the warrior tribes most definitely and stuff like that so yeah <laughs> uh, count me in i'm i love glad <laughs> glad of your tv or something like that <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, and this uh, episode did win an Emmy Award for Best Art Direction for the design of the Klingon Great Hall. So that's noteworthy as well. All right. Okay. Um, so for my, is it to me? Yeah. Final, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we do not okay. have two more. Is it not, do we not have five picks? Oh, well, we'll do, we'll do three and two honorable mentions. Oh, yeah, yes. Oh, right. yeah. Oh, I'm actually golden. And I do have two honorable mentions. And I, I, I overpicked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, now I have to decide. There's too many. Okay, I'm going to go with the survivors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a survivor. <laughs> so this is the one where Deanna has an earworm bad, right? The music is playing in her head and the planet completely destroyed except for a lovely square green patch of grass with a house on it. And here we learn that Kevin and Rashawn Uxbridge, I love that name, uh, they're an elderly married couple. <clears throat> excuse me, an elderly married couple and they're content to stay on their planet. And they, uh, so we get to why I chose this. Um, wow. This is the first time that Troy wears her turquoise dress, which I will be cosplaying in August. As a side note, I went and had my dress measurements and sent them to uh, my friend's daughter, who's going to be making me the dress. She's so excited. She's got a pattern and everything. So I'm very excited. So 
but that's a side note. Um, but what I like about this episode is that we're introduced to Kevin and really he has this remarkable, remarkable power only compared to Q who's greater Kevin or Q. Based on having watched Home Alone, I would say Kevin is a much more ingenious person uh, than Q. Oh, sorry, wrong franchise. Carry on. <laughs> Richard, who do you think's more powerful? Who's greater? Oh, man. I mean, he destroys an entire race, civilization, 50 million. You know, I'm surprised he didn't destroy the Q continuum, too. You know what I mean? Like, how far does his uh, does his uh, power go? Yeah, I and mean, it was said with just a thought. This Husnock race, fifty billion. I mean, I, it, it brings up so many questions. Like, who's who's greater, Q or Kevin? Because that's pretty amazing power. I think he had a bad case of the Mondays. Probably one day, just like he came back from his Easter weekend, no more chocolate left. And he was like, God, I just hate this planet. I wish that we were. I wish it was all dead, and I didn't have to go to work. Oh, 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 this is not. This isn't good. <laughs> well, at least uh, you know. At least Q can reverse what he's done. I don't know. I mean, I guess we we really don't see the extent of his power. I guess you know what? Actually, we probably can't. He probably can't reverse what he's done because once he creates the thought, that's it, and then it's it, uh, he doesn't revert it back to where it's supposed to go. So I would assume well, Q's. I probably. always thought that I always thought that Q's that those were like taken out. That those are you know experiments. That they're not. Like him shooting the Enterprise to go see the Borg. I mean, that's, he didn't undo that, you know, because that's like in the timeline. But like Tapestry, to me, that's like pulled out of time and it's this little experiment with Picard. Or when they're taken Cupid, you know, that's obviously them being pulled out for this Robin Hood adventure, you know. So I always thought of Q being like pulling him out of the timeline for this little experiment. But, you know, with Q uh, throwing the Enterprise to the Delta Quadrant to meet the Borg for the first time, I mean, that's pretty powerful. Um, Are you saying like Q is more merciful? Like instead of uh, instead of the uh, instead of the guy that's in Survivor or Survivors, well, I think Kevin was just so torn up from losing his wife, you know, that he overreacted, sadly to say. Um, so maybe Q has more control. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Hmm. Maybe he's the know. primitive uh, primitive or not Q, but Q is the more evolved one in. Uh, um, the survivor is uh, the more is the primitive one. I don't know. Yeah. And I think this episode deserves special praise, and it, it was nearly on my honorable mention for one and only reason: the line "Good tea, nice house." A yes, classic. I have that. <laughs> Good tea, nice house. Nice house. <laughs> yes, Worf's wonderful one-liners. Um, I was, uh, you know, researching this and the. Uh, actor who plays Kevin, John Anderson, uh, had recently lost his own wife. And he says that this episode was the most difficult in his acting career to, to play this. And I thought that was, that was special. So yeah, I, uh, chose the survivors for my third. So Lee, give us an honorable mention. My honorable mention goes to The Price, our first little trip to the Delta Quadrant. And kind of, I think by this point with the Ferengi in season three, with Menage a Trois, Menage Troy. Sorry, something's on my mind there on Easter <laughs> Sunday that was ever so wrong. Um, between Menage a Troy and um, The Price, I think we're starting to nail kind of the Ferengi's vibe here. That in season one and two, we're playing with them being a bit sinister and a bit of a, a bad villain. Um, and now, now they're kind of getting at their best when they're a bit of comic relief, a bit of fun, when their stupidity kind of is pushing forward the story in a, in a more amusing sense and um, then kind of like pushing them as a threat. Um, so that was good. And to see our first glimpse of the Delta Quadrant um, was, was a treat as well. So that was a, a big first at the time, you know. We've, we'd only seen really the Alpha and Beta Quadrant. So even though it was only for a few minutes, we start to see the, the bigger universe at play. Wait, I'm confused. Was this story about Frangie or is this the episode we lost Lee on? 
Yes. Yeah. Lockley. <laughs> yes. Um, this was the episode where they, uh, they're they selling the wormhole. And um, as we heard on one of our previous episodes where they should have got the Stargate SG-1 team to help out. Um, and then the Ferengi uh, end up bidding on it. <laughs> I yeah, I actually like this episode, and it, you know, and I love it that they tied it into Voyager. It it's such it's such a great. Uh, I mean, obviously, un, I don't know if it was intentional or not. Well, eventually, would they would have to address it, but um, yeah, I absolutely love this uh, episode mainly because you see it on Voyager, or at least the you see what happens to them in Voyager. So, yeah, <laughs> yes. All right, Richard, give us one of your honorable mentions. Honorable mentions. I really didn't. Well, you know what? Uh, Screw it. I'll just do it. So I chose Who Watches the Watchers. Is that one of the ones that we were banned? You can't choose that one. Are you kidding me? Ah, Damn it. Nice try. Is it because it reminds you of your favorite Star Trek movie, Insurrection? (laughs) (laughs) Actually, it's because of the tapestry uh, that's on uh, Picard's uh, back. I, you know, that's actually the only, uh, that's one of the, whenever I look for in in his quarters or in his, um, in his uh, ready room, I always look for that uh, in any episode or every episode after, obviously, who watches to watchers. So um, it's not Nemesis. I know that much. It's not? No, that's the only time it the, it doesn't pop up as far as I'm aware. Huh. Oh, well. All right. Well, let's screw it. We'll just go with Tin Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta Richard's have Tin got Man. a Richard. <laughs> so, if forward listeners, if you were interested, that's Earl Grey 163. And that I is that one of the best episodes ever because it's my <laughs> Star Trek experience. <laughs> it <laughs> but, is. But it's a great episode. It really is. I mean, it's a it's a very playful well, not really playful. It's um <laughs> it's a really it's a really good episode. I mean, it's it's by far um, you know, what started my fandom. So, here we go. So, if you want to start your fandom on Tin Man, go for it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, since uh, since of the father was one of my honorable mentions, I only have one left to pick, and that is the hunted. And uh, this is the one where uh, the Enterprise D is reviewing uh, this planet's application to the Federation membership. And we have this escaped prisoner, and he's amazing. He knows how to escape. And so seeing the Enterprise just trying to catch him is so much fun and get to see all of his strategies. And um, however, though, we do see that this this is um, that he's a representation of this, what the government has done to um, its war veterans and putting them in this. Oh, but it's a nice place. You know, even if you make things nice, it's still prison if you can't leave. So I chose the hunted. Yeah, the super soldier serum. <laughs> I know. I'm like, don't create anything you can't handle, you know, yeah. and we see that yeah. a lot. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, this I, I actually like this episode as well. This is actually my second honorable. So, uh, <laughs> but like, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it definitely hits home more because, I mean, we do see veterans coming back and, you know, they're changed uh, from they I mean, obviously, they're not the same person that, uh, like they come back uh, before the uh, before the war and uh, they've changed quite a bit. And um I, especially if I mean, especially when the war is over. I mean, what else are you supposed to do? I mean, is that, that, if that's your identity and that's all you that's all you are, then what are you supposed to do? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just crazy on how how um, society in general treats treats them as well. Um, I mean, I'm no I'm no super soldier uh, special forces or anything like that. Close, but no, <laughs> but no. Uh, it's it's just yeah, it's just crazy on this story on how they're treated. Yeah. Yeah, this uh, episode, uh, we have Iron Stephen Bear did a rewrite, and it was his first day as staff writer. So shout out to him, because we all love him. And James Cromwell, what more do we need to say? Love him. Oh, Ram, you. Oh, oh, wrong (laughs) wrong TV. (laughs) (laughs) That'll do pick. No, no, wrong franchise again. What is with me today? (laughs) There's four so, movies. Lee, did you like The Hunted? <laughs> yeah, I, I can barely remember a thing about it. Um, I do remember oh. enjoying it, um, but it's an episode in, in all the 176-odd episodes of TNG that sort of falls through the cracks, as it were. So maybe I'll need to check it out. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe you should. And yeah, so all right, Ooh, Lee. I do what's, have, yep, one, I have more. one more. Yes. And we would be amiss if we did not highlight this as an unsung episode. Evolution, um, topical choice here on a. Uh, uh, Easter Sunday um, because it's the first time that we see the collars on the uniform so we have automatically become peak next generation so we've gone from the, the lowly bowels of season 1 and 2 now they've got the pips on the, their uh, their necks this is officially the best Star Trek series ever maybe um, so yeah and there's the return of Dr. Crusher Pulaski's never ever heard from again you know she just just vanished and um, she must not have enjoyed Shades of Grey that much. Um, so yeah, Crusher's back. Um, it's the start of season three. Um, and yeah, it's a good enough episode, but those callers, you know, that's the big turning point it. in the franchise. Yeah, it's, it not, it's not the writers and the budgets and all that. It is the introduction of the callers. Well, season three, Next Generation, isn't the only topic we've been talking about here on the network. Here's a quick look at what you might have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, Standard Orbit. Best of both worlds. It's a good episode. I, episodes. I, I enjoyed it. I remember when it first took off. Family was a hundred times better to me. I'd watch Family ten times to one over watching Best of Both Worlds or Inner Light. Those are the types of things that interest me. And I do enjoy the action-adventure pieces of it. I truly do. But I, I love seeing the characters. And that's why Wrath of Khan works. Warp 5. It was just mesmerizing to me. And I remember when my, my dad, a long time ago, had an airplane. He would take us up flying, but never, you know, we'd hold the wheel and say, hey, we're flying an airplane. But I never really was bitten by the flying bug. But it happened right there on a runway in Hawaii, on Oahu. The 602 Club. And we saw it in the first alien as well. I mean, like the company sent them to yes. yep. to, to yep. the planet to bring that alien back, right? And uh, I, I didn't remember the part where in this film where Burke sent the, the colonists to go and find the ship on his own without authority from the company. I had forgotten that part. So that was kind of an interesting revelation seeing this movie for the first time and... 12 or 13 years, however long it's been since I've seen this. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. You can listen to every show on the network at Trek.fm with links for iTunes, streaming services, and a direct download link. This episode of Earl Grey is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 150,000 titles for iPhone, iPod, iPad, Kindle, Android, Windows Phone, plus Mac or PC. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. Thank you, Audible, for supporting Earl Grey and Trek FM. If you are a weekly listener and would like to directly help Earl Grey, please consider becoming a patron of Trek FM. At patreon.com slash Trek FM, you can choose a pledge level and receive rewards. For example, $5 a month gets you into our patron zone. You get exclusive content and access to our early release of all of the shows. At the $15 a month, you get to participate in our monthly roundtable discussions. They are so much fun, and that's how I got started on the network. At $25 a month, you get associate producer credits for any podcast you choose. At this time, we would like to thank our current Patreon associate producers, Michael Huter and Justin Ozer. Thank you for supporting Earl Grey. Another way to help out the network and get cool stuff is to visit Redbubble. At redbubble.com slash shop slash Trek FM, you can find amazing designs for t-shirts, pillows, phone cases, and more. And with each purchase, a portion of the sales goes to Trek FM. Connect with other Trek FM listeners on our Facebook discussion group called The Babel Conference. You can search that on Facebook, B-A-B-E-L, or you can like the Facebook.com slash Trek FM page for show updates and other announcements. The network is also on Twitter at Trek FM. If you would like to contact Lee, Richard, or me... Amy, visit trek.fm slash contact to send us a subspace message or find us on social media. So Richard, where can people find you on the internet? Well, they can find me exclusively only on Facebook. 
because that is the only social media platform I am on now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they can find me in the Babel Conference, uh, pop in here and there for a little trouble here and there, as as you heard about the Klingons. But otherwise, um, yeah, that's that's it. So, yeah. And Lee? Uh, yeah, you can find me on um, the internet at Lee underscore Nostromo. Um, flying the flag for Alien is always there. It's Alien Day soon, so that's exciting. Um, and I get to see Alien Covenant weeks before all of you Americans. So, yeah, it, it, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Um, and, yeah, you can find me on the Filibuster podcast talking about nerd and geek culture. Um, you can find me behind the scenes somewhat on the Glasgow's Green podcast. And you can find me kicking around being a geek in edinburgh so yeah there you go and thanks for asking you can find me (laughs) on twitter at miss amy nelson i got a twitter account just for star trek so you can uh, follow me there and but my favorite place really is the babel conference on facebook so join us next time for another cup of earl gray Eaten any good books lately? Today is a good day to die. Great joy and gratitude. <laughs>